I'm Suzette Bryan. I'm going to be speaking on making a good impression and the science behind it. So um, we'll be talking about that. I'll be going first. Um, and we to, um, to my left is Jeff Stewart. He's going to be talking about sort of how to make that connection between you and your project. So where's your passion and how do you do those kinds of things? Laurie Sutherland and Mohan Sudar will be talking about the, the kinds of things that you should really think about. Um, and I was listening to uh, Laurie and she was talking about, yeah, your resume and things like that. And I, I was thinking to myself, oh my God, I, I probably need to go back and revise my resume. You know? So I think um, hopefully we will give you some information that you will need. What we'd like to do is we'd like to go ahead and do brief presentations and then leave a, lot of, a little bit of time after for questions. So if that works for you, um, but before we start, I do have some questions for you because um, I'm gonna talk about the science behind making a good first impression. And years ago, I heard a keynote speaker and he said, um, it doesn't matter what kind of first impression you make because people will make a, a, another impression of you later. And I thought to myself as I'm listening to him, that is the worst advice anyone could ever give, the worst advice. And I didn't know the science behind it right then, but I do now. And so I kind of have a two-part question. Do you think making a first impression is important and why? And that's anybody. Yes. Yes, yes. yes. Okay, why don't you have a second chance to make a first impression? Because you have just one, that moment to make a first impression. If you miss it, you have to have a redo. You know, can, can you tell me your name? Benjamin. Benjamin. I mean, you should come to the head of the class. You know, I'm a college professor. You, you, get, you get an A and a star. What did you? You. You bet. And I'm going to tell you two of the main reasons that we know from science um, and we know from cognitive neuroscience about making a good first impression. The first is that um, when we meet, when we first meet a person, um, it is friend or foe. We make a determination whether they're friend or foe. And if we don't know them, we think foe. Um, we produce a neurochemical called oxytocin. Has anybody ever heard of that? Yeah. So what does oxytocin do? Anybody can tell me? Bonding hormone. Bonding hormone. Okay, who, did you say that? Who said bonding hormone? I did. Uh, <laughs> very good. Yes, bonding hormone. You know, but what we know is that it is a bonding hormone only if you're already bonded. And there is some research, some of it done here at UTD, good for us, that says that it really works a little bit more um, in a complex manner. And so what we know is if you are already bonded to someone, it makes you bond with them more. If you are not bonded with them, it makes you more suspicious of them. So it is really, really important to bond with someone at the very first. The other thing is that, and I think um, you, you said that, Benjamin, you said if you, you only have one chance to make a first impression. And that is very true because our brains are kind of lazy. They um, only are like 3% of our body weight, but they use 20% of our metabolic energy. And it takes more energy to change your mind than it does to do the same old, same old, which is why habit formation is so so hard to, to start new habits. You know, anybody who says, I'm going to start a diet or I'm going to, you know, do all those kinds of things, that's hard because your brain doesn't really like that. Um, and so as a consequence, once you make a bad first impression, you really, um, that is very lasting. Now, can somebody's brain change? Sure it can, but it is very hard to change it. So um, in the handout, I have four things that you should do to make a good first impression. Um, the first one, and I'm going to look at my cheat sheet so I can always remember, the first thing is that you smile. Why do you think it's important to smile? Friendly. Friendly, absolutely. Welcoming, absolutely. I'm sorry, what? 
It sets the other person at ease. And what is the other person more likely to do? Smile back, exactly. And actually, when you smile, it bathes, it's like giving your, your, your body and your brain this neurochemical bath that is so helpful to it. So smiling is good for you, and it's good for the other person. So smile first. The next thing is look them in the eye. And now, I'm going to say this with a caveat, because if they're from a Western culture, you want to look them in the eye. There are some cultures that it's considered rude. But why would you want to look somebody in the eye? Trust. How does it build trust? I'm willing to look someone in the eye and be blind and not blind. <laughs> okay, and how, how would you know that they, I mean, you know, my favorite, my favorite, person is Bill Clinton, you know, looking you right in the eye and saying, I did not have sex with that woman, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know, but, you know, so, so yeah, so what do you think, what do you think happens? Do you, can you, can you, like, point a finger at it, maybe? Well, I, would, I know the phrase that the eye is the path of the soul. And, and you are, that you are so right. You know, what happens is, when we are interested in someone, our pupils dilate. Yes. That is an unconscious signal. That I mean, well, you can't say, oh, I'm going to make my pupils dilate. But it, <laughs> but it is an unconscious signal that we send and that is received. And so if you're looking someone in the eye and you're interested in them, they will see your pupils dilate. They will know you're interested in them. And they will be more interested in you. I always think, you know, that's the idea behind the meeting someone at a bar, right, where it's dark, and so your pupils are dilated. You think they're the most interesting person in the world. <laughs> the, by the light of the next day, not so much, right? <laughs> um, so you want to smile. You want to look them in the eye. You want to shake their hand firmly and tell them your name. Why do you want to do that? Confidence. Confidence, absolutely. Why do you want to shake their hand? If you can make that contact, if you can make that contact, that is another, that is something else that goes on in your brain that is very, very, very helpful. And then you want to ask them a question to create a connection. Because why? You want to go from being part of their out group, where they're producing the oxytocin and it makes them suspicious, to part of their in group where they're producing the oxytocin that makes them want to bond. Um, and so I have those four things in here, and I could talk about this for days. I'm not going to do that, but I'm just going to give you one example to finish up. Um, my late husband was a huge LSU fan, huge Tiger fan. I mean, he bled purple and gold. And you could have been Jack the Ripper, but if you went to LSU... <laughs> He was going to be your best friend. And so it's really making that connection, thinking about how to make that connection. And once you do, then all of the other things that these people in the panel are going to talk about today, these wonderful experts, will make more sense. And the person that you're, you're, you're com communicating with will listen to you and will, and will really want to be more receptive to uh, what you have to say. So with that, I'll um, toss it to whomever would like to speak next. Go. Go. Sure, okay, uh, so I guess I'm at five one, my name. My name is Laurie Sutherland, and I've been in the staffing industry over 20 years. I've built companies, I've managed them, I've been on just about every side of staffing that you can imagine, and, you know, I'm just a glutton for punishment. I just love it. I love to be abused. It's my favorite thing. Um, so given that, I have a question, because I want to check the relevance of what I'm about to say. How many people in this room are currently looking for a new job? Will you raise your hand? Okay, so we have... <laughs> Yeah, we have, or, or, or may, yeah, or maybe you're thinking about making a move and you don't want to raise your hand. I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. I'm really good with that. You know, <laughs> open, open to work. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. I, you know, a lot of people that know me, I've been, I have so many friends I've made throughout the years. You know, they'll call and go, you know, can you review my resume? You know, or. 
Um, I'll talk to them about, you know, how to cast a wide net if you're looking for a position. And one individual, I didn't know him that well, and, and I was just going over about what I'm about to go over with you guys. But I'd mentioned dice, and he's like, dice? And I said, yeah, you know, you're in IT, and I didn't know it was still relevant. And it was a few months later, he called me back and just thank me, because he got his dream job, because I would have never put my resume on DICE. Um, obviously, LinkedIn Recruiter, and I'm going to let Mohan go into more details about that, but LinkedIn is our number one um, recruiting board. Um, where our recruiters, um, we have around 25 recruiters have seats into LinkedIn, and that is the most powerful um, uh, place for you to have open to work. And, and a lot of people don't know this. If you have a job and you might are interested in making a move, if you go in and put open to work, your employer will not see that. Now, don't put the ring around your face because that's going to be like super obvious. But, you know, some people, believe it or not, you know, they don't, they don't know that. I've never in my last 20 years, I can never say never, but so far in 20 years, I've never heard anyone come back and say, you know, my employer, you know, and if that anomaly were to happen, you could always say, God, you know, tell a little white lie. You know, I didn't realize that. You know, nothing's wrong with a whitey sometimes if you have to. Um, so the, um, so LinkedIn and Dice, and then the next one is in, Indeed. A lot of people don't know about Indeed. Um, and then good old Monster. It's still relevant today. You might have to sift through a lot of things, but Monster is another one. Um, and then also Career Builder. So um, those are, you know, that's called, you know, casting a wide net. And I don't want to bore you to death, but I just want to share with you guys our recruiters sometimes, they may view 500 LinkedIn profiles in one day, 500, and it's quick. Or they may review three or 400 resumes in a day because we get, we might have 15, 20 positions and they're looking, you know, keywords, summary. Um, I get, I see resumes and it's not doing, you know, people with super small font or various fonts. Um, in your resume, it's okay to don't have more. It's recommended to have no more than two font sizes. So you want your header can be a little bit larger and then have another font size. And just, you know, consistency is, is huge. Um, KPIs, um, you know, project managers here, you know, what have you done? If you can quantify things. Um, another thing I see are too many fluff words. I mean, that's great, you're a servant leader or you're a hard worker and all that's great and a few of those is okay, but when there's too much of that, no one knows you, they, they're not sure they even believe you. I mean, what recruiters are really looking at is tenure. Um, they don't like blank spots, you know, in resumes. Um, and so um, usually the best way is 10 years of experience. And then unless you're fresh out of college or maybe you just got your MBA and you want to highlight it, education is usually at the end because on y'all's level, people want to see you know, pertinent experience. It is good to have one resume, just a general run, ready to go. But if you have vertical industry experience, albeit healthcare, or um, you know, logistics, transportation, something like that, you would be amazed, like create that and then you know, customize that on the fly. And another tricky thing um, is if let's say you've been a program manager or director of program management, but you're open to being a, a program manager, you know, in your summary, because clients are afraid to hire someone. Um, that might be overqualified, but let's say you want to be a project manager. So your summary is important because you have to think, no one is going to go by and read every single little word of your resume to make sure in your summary that it says exactly who you are, you know, what you're looking for. And as soon as a client, um, one of our clients gets your resumes, they're going to go straight to LinkedIn. <laughs> And so get your dates straight, you know, get a, get a picture, um, don't recommend sunglasses or, you know, with a drink in your hand. I've seen some, you know, just, that's just not a good thing. 
Um, and those are kind of just general um, general things I wanted to, to share with you guys. Does anyone have any questions? I feel like I've been talking a long time. Yes. In terms of you say you're doing a lot of recruiting, say through LinkedIn, and you can put on there that you're open for hiring. How about for consulting jobs or part-time positions? Do you use those facilities for that also? And how would you know that somebody is not looking for full-time versus part-time versus consulting? Yeah, that is, work? that is a great question. And fortunately, LinkedIn has all those options. You can put direct hire, contract, part-time. So when you go in there and you it's, it, and look into settings, just go to your profile, you can, you can check all that. And when we're back there recruiting, you know, we'll look, you know, direct hires only or contractors. If we have a part-time gig, so that's all you do. Yes. Oh, of course. Hello. I've heard that it's difficult to kind of beat that algorithm so that these employers are actually receiving your resume, what would be your recommendations to make sure that yours is kind of part of that bucket? Okay, I can answer that, but would you like to fill that one? Because that's right, kind yeah, of your... You can, I'll, I can go ahead and tackle it, I'll, I'll take care of it. You want to, yeah. I might, I might ahead, miss go ahead, something. Go ahead and intro it. And we'll, uh, okay, I'll... yeah, that's, that, that is a great question. So extremely important, and this is, don't want to steal your thunder okay. about the LinkedIn. Okay. I cannot stress, when we're back and we're looking for positions, we're creating searches, bullion searches. It's all about keywords. So in your LinkedIn, you want to put, like under the keywords, um, as many keywords as you can. Um, when you're um, explaining your position and your bullet points, again, you know, more keywords because that is how you're going to end up. If I do a very specific search, you know, let's say, you know, they want a, a project manager that's worked on Azure only or AWS. That's it. If, those, if AWS or Azure, if that's not in there, um, City of Arlington is a big client of mine. I've worked with them for seven years. For some reason, all their PMs must be PMI certified. Make sure all your certifications are in there. So just, just keywords, keywords, and I don't know. Did I answer? Yeah, no, or? you got it. I mean, I'll, I'll head into LinkedIn, but here, you, hit, you hit the uh, okay. points there. Right? Okay, okay, yeah. yeah. So Mohan, would you like to? Uh, sure. But yeah, th thanks, Lori, for sure. entering that. So yeah, first off, thanks to uh, PMI Dallas and uh, UT Dallas for hosting us today. Appreciate being here on the panel and being with you this afternoon. Uh, so I'm going to go a little bit into LinkedIn, and if I can take a little bit of a liberty here, this might be the only time you might be able to hear a speaker say this is, you can actually use your mobile phone during this, my segment here. Um, so how many of you have LinkedIn today on your phone? Okay, awesome. That might be the easiest question you're going to get right from me. Um, so what we're going to do is actually do just a little bit of LinkedIn 101, just very briefly. It's just a, a brief taste of this. So to kind of highlight some of Lori's points, I mean, this is... You know, recruiters, and hopefully I'm not giving away too much, Lori, but they pay $10,000 a year to LinkedIn to be able to find people like you every year. $10,000 a year. So it's an investment on their side, but it's also an investment in you because they're trying to find the most qualified project management, program management candidates out there in the marketplace today. But if we go to LinkedIn really quick, I want to, you know, have everyone go to their, their home page where they can view their profile. Is everyone there yet? Show of hands, we're good? All right. So when you think about what Lori just talked about with what is under your picture, right? So let's just talk about the, the photo first. So how many of you today, this is just to show of hands, how many of you today, when you look at your LinkedIn profile, feel that you actually have a professional looking photo? Show of hands here. Okay, so I'm gonna presume that you've gone to a professional photographer, you've actually taken the photo, You've got a good contrast between your face and the background, and everything checks out pretty clean. So link, that's actually good in your case, because when you have a presentable photo, you actually get 40% more views on LinkedIn. That's, that's true. And to some of the earlier comments about the, uh, you know, the, the bonding piece, when you smile in the photo, that also enhances it even more. 
So I can't speak about the pupil dilation, but I, I think for sure, uh, I think for sure that at least as far as the virtual bond is concerned, you know, you're, you're trying to bridge that gap. All right. Uh, but as far as the other things you need to be looking at is what's behind your photo. So typically I see this in a lot of cases, what's called a banner or background. And a lot of the things that you see in the banner and background are sometimes blank. There's really nothing there. And that's an op and so the other thing I also see is people showcase their company's brand. And so those are to me red flags because LinkedIn's giving you that space to showcase your own professional brand. So if you, for example, if you take a look at, if you can go to Google Images, you can go to things like Pexels, you can go to things like uh, pixabay.com, you can get images from any of these sites and you can post it behind your photo. And you, but it has to represent the industry. So Lori just talked about if you happen to be specializing in a vertical like healthcare or construction or IT, make sure people get that imagery of you, right? This is your brand, right? This is you taking control of your brand today. So I want you to think about how you can incorporate that background and that photo so that it says something about you coming out of today's session. All right, so, that, so that's one thing as far as the background and profile photo. Now, underneath your photo on your mobile app, you're gonna see your name. Now, how many of you today actually have PMPs? How many people in the room are PMPs here? Okay, I better see more hands, but, you know, but that's okay, uh, we're good. But if you don't have your, if you have your PMP today, if you have your PMP, put that in your, what we call your SEO header. That is what drives traffic. So again, how do you get indexed by a recruiter? When a recruiter is looking for you on LinkedIn and they're saying, well, I need someone who's PMP certified. If you don't have it in what you call your search op engine optimization header, you're missing out on a golden opportunity. So if you're actually looking for work today or you're thinking about looking for different jobs. Get that, put your name, comma, PMP. It'll take about a couple of days for the algorithm to update itself, but you're gonna be indexed more when you, go, when you go, go ahead and conduct those searches. Now the other piece that's a little bit, you know, confounding here for a lot of folks is what do you put under your name after you put PMP? Well that again is part of your SEO header. It's you have to put what do you do as a profession. Now I see people sometimes put project managers, program manager, that's actually a good start because if you're looking for those roles, you should be putting senior project manager, senior program manager. If you're aspiring to something higher, say this aspiring to be senior project manager, that's what helps you get indexed on LinkedIn right away. So for those of you today, how many of you have project or program manager in your SEO header? It's right under your name. Okay, so we have about, I'm gonna say maybe 30 to 40% of the room. By the time everyone leaves this room, 90 to 100% of you should have project or program manager if that's what you do today. Of course, if you do something else, I can't speak to that, but you should at least be able to put that career or that role that you serve in today. Now, as far as, again, the other thing that I see in the SEO header, people put their employer's name, again, I'm gonna advise you not to do that because people will say project manager at IBM or program manager at you know, whatever company they work at. That's your space, not theirs. So take command of your, take control of your brand right now. That, that's what's gonna help you get indexed faster with re recruiters. The other section I wanna talk about is what we call the about section. And folks should be able to scroll down a little bit. So under, if you scroll down to analytics resources, you should see the about section. How many people see that in their, in their view? Show of hands. Yeah, about 40, hopefully everyone got to that section here in about a second or two. This is where your elevator speech comes into play. This is all about telling a recruiter, not just who you are, but what do you do? What value do you bring? And as Lori was mentioning in the resume section, what are the, how do you summarize your accomplishments into an executive level summary? How do you show them what value you're, you're delivering? So in other words, are you someone who's on the revenue generating side? Are you someone who specializes in operational efficiency? What do you do for that company? What value do you bring? So I don't wanna steal Jeff's thunder because I know he's gonna touch a little bit on that. But that's where you start to, that's where you start to tell that story. It's telling that compelling story. 
why should this recruiter care about reading your profile? Why should they care about reading your resume? That's what the point of this about section is. Now, this is a little tip here. So once you, if you, it'll take a few drafts to get the about section right, just like it would your resume or anything else. So it's not gonna be clean the first time out. But include your contact information. And then also include what I call a date stamp update. So I want everyone to think about, and this is like LinkedIn hygiene in a way, but you wanna update that every three to six months. Because you just heard from many presenters before us, or probably the past two days since you've been here at the symposium, artificial intelligence. It's, it's just flying everywhere around you, right? It's sort of omnipresent no matter which room you're sitting in. The question is, what are you doing about it? Are you actually taking new courses, certifications? Are you actually getting yourself immersed in new projects, new papers, whatever the case may be? And are you including it in that about section? So those are things you want to think about as you continue to evolve your career as a project or program manager. Now the rest of these items I'm gonna to just touch on here briefly because I'd like to give Jeff some time here, but the, the other part is the experience section. So that is a straight copy and paste from your resume. But that presumes your resume is all set up and ready to go. So in other words, if you don't have your accomplishments written out, if you're not putting metrics behind your accomplishments in terms of saying, I grew, I helped to grow this business by X percent, or I helped to you know, save X dollars in this company, go back to your resume, get that right, and then copy and paste it in your LinkedIn. That's also part of the indexing for as far as what recruiters are gonna be looking for. Now, as far as some other tips and tricks, since it's in the handout here, but basically you want people to also list all, all your skills. You have 50 skills. You can list up to 50 skills on LinkedIn today. You can also order the skills that are most relevant to your profile. So you wanna get that out of the way. They could be hard skills, they could be soft skills. And another thing you can do with your network is ask your network to endorse you for what skills they feel or you feel are appropriate for your profile today. And as far as recommendations, I would get at least two recommendations in the last two years. So if you're hitting on that, if you've already checked that box off, great, but if you don't have a recommendation today, Look around you. There are folks who probably know of your work or are currently working with you to know who you really are, what value do you deliver. Get recommendations from them. And of course, we can talk about this on and on, but uh, these are some helpful, hopefully these are helpful tips because I think what we wanna do coming out of the session today is to get your LinkedIn traffic up. But that's only as good as the quality of content that you put in your LinkedIn. Uh, I do want to go in the elevator speech a little bit, but, but right now I want to actually hand it off to Jeff who's going to tell you a little bit about the, uh, the value piece. Sure. So uh, my role is to really talk about it if you're not looking for a new role outside of the company you're in, but if you're looking for a new role inside of the company you're in. So to talk about how you build relationships, how you communicate about your value, and how you communicate about your connection to the why of the organization in order to find your next role or to grow the role you're currently in inside of the organization. Because you know, ultimately, yes, you can go get a new job, but that's nerve wracking for you as the associate. And it's even more nerve wracking for the person who's doing the hiring in, as well as you gotta figure out how to switch 401ks and that's impossible anyway. So, I mean, switching all those benefits, it's a nightmare, it's a hassle. So why not stay with the company you're at? So I'm gonna go through three things I, I just mentioned. And, and to work through first is to know your why. Now, I am lucky that I work for a nonprofit um, healthcare organization. So we are extremely mission driven. The mission is at the core of everything we do. Um, but I invite you to find that in whatever work you're in today or whatever company you're at. And I'll give you a, a quick example. Currently working on a it's been a been multi-year project for provider data management to clean up our provider data management. Uh, we have a tremendous mess on our hands and it's, a, it's an icky IT kind of governance of integration and all of that. And, um, but yet, what it means is that every time we can make an advance in getting our data correct, we bring our care closer to the communities that we serve. We make it, e every time we improve that piece of data, we make it easier 
for a patient to find a physician to heal themselves, to heal their child, to take care of their family. And that absolutely matters. And so when we have the people in our IT departments, in our projects, in our credentialing, in our medical staff, whoever's over that project, and they actually understand that this sort of ugly, messy, monotonous work actually connects to providing care to somebody in one of our communities, it really makes a difference in their passion and their level of commitment to it. So know your why. Know how it connects to the goals of the organization. So our, our organization has a five-year strat strategic plan. And again, it, to keep hitting that example, bringing our care to our ministries that we serve, Catholic healthcare, so we use words like ministries. Um, but we're bringing our care to our ministries is part of our strategic goals. And we actually have technology foundations, people foundations, um, and network foundations as part of that strategic plan. So knowing where your project, no matter how large or small, connects into that strategic plan and being able to articulate that really matters for you being able to understand your why in the organization. Point two, take the time to develop relationships. Uh, there's a classic sociological article by Granovetter called The Strength of Weak Ties, and understanding how social capital works and that if you can increase the number of ties that you have throughout the organization, it has a multiplicative effect on your ability to have social capital in the organization. So you might get on a large call, and it might be that you're the project manager over, and there's 10 people, and there's 10 work streams that you have to go over. Um, and it's really easy to just move quickly through those. But after the call, take the time to follow up and understand and get to know each one of those people, not in depth, Right? You don't need to know their life story. You don't need to be able to be a godfather to the next child or godmother to the next child. But you should at least understand what their context is, what their why is, how they contribute to the organization, and how you can help them with that. Um, you know, for example, we have a large integration project going on now where we've bought a health system in New Mexico and getting them integrated into all of our strategies. And there's a project manager that I'm working with um, on the, um, she's in our performance excellence group. And she's taken the time outside to actually understand my context. So I have a small part of making sure they have signs, right? That's a pretty, pretty easy-ish thing to do. And it'd be really easy to show up to every call and say, when is the next deadline for the signs? And do you need any help with it, right? No, we'll have permits due on Tuesday. Okay, that's it, thanks. But I often miss my deadlines. And then so understanding why. Well, we actually have had a number of organizational disruptions or we've had this other major project come in or we're in the middle of provider data management. Nobody can find anybody on the website, so it's a big problem. And so actually then taking the time to understand some of those um, challenges that I have and bring that into her work has allowed her to understand what I do better. So now I have a level of trust with her as well as for her to help speak for us outside of our particular work stream, which again increases her value to me as a, in my marketing uh, world, but she also has increased her value to everybody as she continues to build those relationships outside of um, just her little scope. So she takes the time and she invests in those relationships and builds that social capital and then understands more people throughout the organization. And then finally, I would say, increase your communication. And I don't mean the, request, the communication that is determined by the RACI or dictated by the project charter. I mean, take the time to actually provide communication to those who need it in a rich sense. Maybe it isn't an email. I know that's shocking, but there are ways to communicate outside of an email. Uh, and I invite you to do that. If you have an important update, Take the time to pick up the phone and call a stakeholder and help un so they can have an op opportunity to react, to ask questions they may not want to ask over email. Again, it helps build that relationship, but it also helps you increase your ability to communicate with those around you and, again, to build those relationships a little bit better. And I would give an example of this because ultimately, as I said, from the um, recruitment side, it is so much easier for us to hire internally because of, we actually have an ability to see your track record, to have worked with you. Uh, and it's 
it lowers that barrier for us if we don't know what we're going to get. When we get you in for the first time and for the first 90 days, we have no idea if you're the kind of person who takes their socks off at their desk or whatever, right? Um, I don't, can I say that? Uh, so, you know, but we, we understand how you, how you work and we understand a lot more about you. And it's, it's interesting, you know, we, and projects by their very nature are often are temporary. And so our provider data management one is unbelievably maybe actually kind of winding up. And as such, the person on the data integration team who's been the project manager over that, who has used that opportunity to understand marketing better, to understand credentialing services, which are a labyrinth of a nightmare, of medical staff services, to understand, and she comes from the data and IT integration, so she understands that. To understand, we actually integrate legal with it, we, understand, we integrate our EHR with it. So she actually has taken the time to understand each of those contexts. So all of us understood that this project was beginning to roll, and we start looking at Jessica and going, well, Jessica, what are you doing next? And uh, suddenly, she has actually moved over to our digital associate HR experience team because she's in high demand, because she took that time to invest in those relationships, to understand my context, to understand the why, to improve her communication, and has been able to transition to, a, and I believe it's an increase in title as well. And so she's been able to build that inside of our organization. And that's really one of the other things too, is don't always assume that your next role is outside of the organization. Your next role may very well be inside of the organization if you can take the time to, to build those relationships and understand your connection and value to the organization. That's great, thank you so much. And Mohan, you said you had some additional comments? Oh no, I think it was just really around LinkedIn. I mean, I, I would just say for those who are open to work right now. Uh, I believe the latest statistic is 33 million people on LinkedIn have enabled the open to work feature wow. on their profile. Um, so that's out of, of course, 800 million plus people. But I would say there's always that, that fine line, like where are you in the job marketplace today? Are you really unemployed, for example? And if you do need to use it, go ahead and enable that feature. However, I think there's probably a certain percentage of you who are cur you know, currently employed but looking to or actively looking to switch jobs or find another uh, career company. To hit on something Lori said, there is another option to, to sort of silently look for that job behind the scenes. So just be aware when you enable that feature, make sure you're clicking the right one based on your current job status or your employment status uh, at this point right now. But, those are things you can do, and of course you have uh, things like job alerts, so if you're interested in companies like, for example, Christus Health, if you wanna work at Christus Health, one of the things you can do is click the follow button, and that's what's gonna get Christus Health interested in you. Not many people know that, but that's how you get, some, that's how you get jobs sent your way. So if you set up the alerts under jobs, setting up things like Christus Health or other employers, that's what is gonna get recruiters connected with you eventually. You gotta give the algorithm a little bit of time. It's, I don't know if it's lightning fast today, but you gotta give it at least a couple of days to reset itself or recalibrate itself to make sure that it's there. But I think those were uh, just a few things there because the other parts are, it does require a screen just to make sure we go through the instructional. I don't wanna necessarily take too much time, but that, that was it, thanks. Well, and I think in the information that you guys can download, there's additional hints and um, additional information concerning this presentation. Um, I wanted to thank everybody here. We're gonna open it up to questions, but I wanted to especially thank Lori because she had a huge wedding on Saturday <laughs> night and she is here with us and, and doing an, an absolute great job. I don't know whether she drank a lot of coffee or what it was, <laughs> but uh, we want to especially thank Lori. So uh, we'd like to open it up for questions now. Um, so. I had a question. Um, uh, it's a two-in-one question. What do you think about adding hobbies um, on LinkedIn, and then also how far, how far back should, I, should you go? Like, mm. should I include what I did when I was 18, or yeah. does, how far back should I, should yeah. it, oh, history? Th thanks for your uh, question. What's your name? Sorry, I didn't get it. My name is Gaboni. Gaboni? Yes. Okay, thanks for your question, Gaboni. Yeah, so as far as your question on hobbies, as an example, let's say today, you, you know, you're interested in 
you know, backpacking or kayaking, if that's kind of what your line of thought was. I would really think about where are you today with your career. So if you're actively employed and you feel you're in a good place with your company, you sort of want to expand on your personality. That might just be good context for your inside network to know about. On the other hand, if you are actively looking for work and you are looking for things that better align with your job search, especially with recruiters, I probably would not include that or emphasize that. What I would talk more about are things like, as an example, like PMI DAOs being a volunteer there right? and saying, what committees do you serve in while you're unemployed? And saying, what is it that I need to really align to in terms of my job search? Because that's what's going to help drive traffic to your site, right? So it depends on which side of the coin you're on, on that one. But does that get to your question? Okay, great, thanks. Thanks for the question. Oh, there's a second part, okay. Oh, oh, sorry, I apologize for my oversight. Um, the history, what I would put there is probably the last two to three years. I probably keep it very recent. I would say, certainly appreciate the long term, if you've been a long term volunteer, I mean, certainly that's fine, but I think to the job search part, if you are looking for align what are the key projects that you've worked on as a volunteer that connect back to what you want to do, whether it's project management or another career. I can't speak for what you do today, but think about how you align it in the last two to three years, because that's where you're going to get questions on. Oh, job history. I would say, I would, yeah, ten, past 10 years. That would be my answer to your question. Past 10 years. Yep. In uh, terms of a number of people here present papers in that. So where would your publications and papers be included in the information you want to make available yep. and, and noted to potential employers? So there is a, a section, if that's a LinkedIn question, um, there's a section here once my LinkedIn decides to refresh itself or update. Uh, let me go to the profile really quickly. But when you go down to uh, experience, education, there's a section in the, in the skills and education section where you can post that information. So you have the ability to, if you have recorded something of yourself or if it's a PowerPoint, uh, you can definitely. Books, publications and papers. Yeah, you, you have a spot there. You, there is a spot where you can, you can put that in today. I'm just trying to locate that here really quickly. But yes, you can put that into LinkedIn today. Uh, just make sure you put the publication you know, year that you, pub, you know, publish the book, the title name. And if you were a co-author, make sure you talk about all the co-authors for that book just in case if it's not a solo publication. So, yes. Just to tie into that one yeah. is what about presentations? They've got a place there for the publications mm -hmm. for papers, yes. but not presentations. Yeah, so if you did something today at the symposium, right, to wrap everything up today, yeah, I would certainly think about putting it there. Um, there's also, of course, we, I wish we had a little bit more time to do more of an interactive thing here, but there is a thing if you, everyone has a feature uh, today on their, on their LinkedIn, and so you can actually put that in what they call a carousel. So what that means is you can showcase that work and put that as a highlighting thing, you know, saying, yes, I recently published this white paper or I recently presented at PMI Dallas, but you have to connect it back to your career, right, to enhance your brand. So you can do that today uh, with those features, yes. That's, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah. How, how active should I be on LinkedIn? How often uh, should you be on LinkedIn? Posting, I would, uh, active, how active. active how active, yeah. Yes. I, would do, I would, you know, for everyone here in the room, I believe everyone is a thought leader in their own way, so you do have valuable content to add. I would probably be posting at least twice or thrice a week. I would be on that. I mean, I use LinkedIn every day, not necessarily to post, but... I may read somebody's post, and the reason for that is I want to keep my, my score up. There's a thing on LinkedIn called your social selling index, your SSI, and the more you use the tool, the more you network with others. Right? There, are, there, are, there are some things LinkedIn specifically looks at, and they grade you on that. So in my case, you know, this will be, sound like, a, like, a, like I'm bragging, but it's basically, it's not that I'm doing anything special, but because I'm consistently using it every day, I'm the top 1% in my industry. 
But that doesn't mean that it's not impossible. It just means you have to be, to your question, on the tool every day, thinking about what kind of value do you want to add to your industry, to your profession. Do you want to build your networks? So you have to just pick what do you want to do with your time every day on LinkedIn. What are your goals as far as building networks, creating valuable content, or just being able to you know, say, hey, I support my community. I support PMI Dallas for their events that they're hosting, things like that. Yes. Yes. I'm a PMP, and I'm currently working as a portfolio and program manager. That means something very different in the project management space yeah. Yeah. than it does in the creative space. Mm -hmm. And clearly, neither LinkedIn nor Indeed mm -hmm. understand that. Mm -hmm. How can I get them to stop recommending <laughs> graphics art type stuff and start recommending project management type of, of roles? Yeah, so if that's a LinkedIn question, I would say what you need to do is when you go and search for jobs, there's a way you can set the job alerts. And if you find that portfolio manager, for example, is under the job alert when you search for open jobs, and they show you a list, there's an option that you can enable once you get the job search. It's, it's basically like a scroll button feature that says set job alert. And if you set that job alert just for portfolio managers, you should be able to get those and only those types of jobs every day. Well, I, well, I haven't seen the results for myself, but okay, I see. So what I would probably, yeah, so what I would probably, again, I haven't, let's just say I haven't gone into that, but what I would think about is if it's portfolio financial management or thinking about, you know, arranging the keywords, I would think about, I would have to do a little bit of trial and error to answer your question about thinking about portfolio um, financial management. Sometimes I would think about, okay, is it portfolio and project management? Because sometimes there are certain jobs and companies with, where it's like PPM, right? And those certain keywords may trigger in that, in that sense. So uh, I'd have to talk to you separately, but those, were, those would be, I'd have to do a little trial and error to answer the question on that to get to your, your specific search. Do you have a question? Yeah. Hi, this question's for Lori. So, We've talked a lot about um, skills and hard skills and accomplishments, but how are companies looking for culture fits? Uh, culture is a very important item in finding a job and finding the right candidate, but I'm curious when people come to you to find um, the right people for the right role, are they asking you to also search for culture and how do you do that to see if they're gonna be right in an organization? No, <clears throat> that, that is a great question. I'm so glad you asked it. So when we get positions from clients, we don't, we don't work on them unless we do an intake call with the hiring manager because we don't have time to waste our time. We don't want to waste their time. And during that call, you know, we'll, we'll ask them that question. You know, what, what soft skills are you looking for? Um, can I come out to your company and walk around through the company in the break room and you get a certain feeling about the company, and sometimes I even bring my recruiters. Uh, we do have soft skill questions that we ask, and some people need to be, I mean, more polished than others. I mean, there's different environments. There's, there's a place for everyone. But that's knowing your client well and um, asking those soft skill questions and also, you know, all of our recruiters know, like, if they're going to be rude to any of our recruiters or cut us off, they're going to do the same thing to you eventually. And people, a lot of people don't respect recruiters, you know. Um, and, I mean, that's unfortunate um, because the recruiters that work for us, um, you know, when they're not respected, you know, because we want, it's very important to us because especially we do direct hire and contract, contract to hire, and you place someone in there, and our clients pay us a lot of money to do this work, and then they leave or get fired. That's a sword in our heart. I mean, we don't want that. Um, so we do all we can to ask those soft skill questions and understand their culture and their environment. Did I answer your question? Okay, good. And I just want one thing, because I, I want the best for everyone here. 
Mohan said something that I just, I want to reiterate a little bit on a, on a deeper level. Um, one of my clients out in Fort Worth had this direct hire. And, I mean, it was, I mean, they said it's a, it's a Chinese speaking purple squirrel. I mean, it was a senior data engineer that had to understand, you know, data modeling and have snowflake and so, and they had to come into the office in Fort Worth. I mean, it's not easy. Um, they were going to pay him very well. We found someone and I sent it over there like, you know, recruiter said, listen, I mean, he texts out beautifully, um, but it's just, I'm getting nothing back. He's, it's monotone and it's just, I kind of want to shake this candidate, but he fits the technical specs and he has great tenure, and so we're going to send him over. But we told the client this, and then he talked to him. He said, yeah, he knocked it out of the ballpark. I'm just not sure about his, I mean, I just got nothing back. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> and then he said, well, let me think about it. And then he called me the next day, and he said, Lori, he said, I read some of his recommendations on LinkedIn, and they were really good. Why don't we bring him in for an in-person? Okay, this guy starts on Monday, at the 28th. So my point in telling everyone that, recommendations, I mean, you know, especially from your boss, <laughs> um, you know, colleagues are good too. I mean, colleagues are great. But if, if you can get from, your, from where you were previously um, recommendations about, you know, your work ethic or competency because... Yes, this guy, I mean, who knows? He could be slightly on the spectrum or something. I mean, he's going to come in and do a great job, and those recommendations got him the second interview in the job, so I'm going to shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I have a quick question. Right here. Um, uh, my question for, for Mohan, uh, you talked about just kind of how to maybe enhance our uh, LinkedIn profile to kind of build a brand. Uh, as project managers, we tend, at least based on my experience, we tend to work on a variety of projects. Like you might maybe work in cybersecurity project today, maybe next year you're working on uh, maybe some analytics type project or BI project. Uh, from a LinkedIn standpoint, does it help to be very specific or very specialized as a project manager or just more, more generic? Yeah, so, yeah, thanks for the question. So as far as uh, being more of a specialist in an industry versus being more broad-based, right, where you're just kind of taking on sort of a hodgepodge of projects, what, how do you, how would you brand yourself, essentially, if you were sort of a generalist? Maybe I think that's your, your question. Uh, what I would say is, as you're branding yourself, I would just say, you've got to find a quality about yourself, regardless of what industry or what company you work in that separates you from the audience, from the crowd. In other words, if you're, for example, if you put, uh, I'm sorry if I didn't catch your name, but uh, if you said to, you know, under your profile, I'm a dynamic team builder, as an example, then it's got to be like, okay, if you're a dynamic team builder, I can drop you into a hot zone anywhere, any company, and you're going to make things happen, right? A lot of you in the room might have this quality already, which is, you get things done, okay, which is fantastic. But one level deeper is, why did you do what you did, to Jeff's point? Tell me more about who are you, right? And so what I would, to, to answer your question, in your SEO header, in your about section, I need to know more about who are you as a person and balance that with the narrative to say, I deliver great projects because this is who I am, this is part of my DNA. You gotta come up with something like that as a generalist, but again, you know, Jeff, you know, from what I've heard, of course, I don't want to mistake Jeff's, you know, his comments today, his <laughs> remarks, but he's deeply passionate about healthcare. You know, both of us have been in healthcare for a while, but we have a reason why we show up to work every day. What is your reason to show up to work? All right, that's what makes the difference. Hopefully that gets to your question. Yeah, all right. Yes, uh, I have a question. First of all, thank you very much for sharing this information with us. It is very interesting and very valuable for all of us. Even, I mean, for those who are not looking for a job now, maybe later, maybe inside the company. But I have a question, I mean, for the, probably Jeff and Mohan. Uh, I mean, you're interviewing a lot of people, right, for different positions. And for example, and you're looking for resumes and you look for a certain skill set, right, for certain when you, they can project managers, program managers, they can communicate, uh, they know, have certain technical knowledge. But for example, if you're interviewing five people people with the same skill set, uh, how, I mean, how your God is telling you this is the right person? 
I mean, all of them have good skills. All of them speak about values because, I mean, there's a lot of practice interviews, right? You need to talk about your numbers, what you bring to the company. So how do you feel? What kind of sign do you see? I mean, this is the right person whom I want to hire. Yeah, it's a good question. And on the resume, it can be really difficult to understand or to maybe even make explicit always. One of the things I do look for is not always healthcare experience. I think we often get that very wrong inside of healthcare. Uh, in my context, I'm in marketing. It helps if you're a nurse if you have healthcare experience. Um, but it, we hire doctors with healthcare experience generally. Uh, but when we, <laughs> when I look on the like the marketing side, the IT side, I'm not necessarily looking at your your experience in healthcare. I'm looking at experience to my context, right? So Christus is a large centralized syst healthcare system. We are a global company um, and we're a nonprofit, which means we're big and slow. Uh, and I look for your ability to thrive in an environment like that. So one of my red flags might be, you might check every box, right? So for some of our marketing technologies we use, like Sitecore or Kairos is our provider data management, what, name the list of technology, you might check all those. But if you're at an agency startup, you're gonna hate it. Right, the first time you're, you're like, I need a $5,000 SOW extension. And I'm like, all right, I'll send that to legal and we'll see you in eight months. Right, like you're gonna be like, what do you mean? Just give me the, and it's like, sorry, that's just how we do it, right? Uh, like, and so I look for things like that on the resume often. Once you get in, there's any number of things that we're looking at, but one of the biggest things it, that I look for is your ability to answer interview questions well. The, the, the car model, as they say, right, context, action, result. Your ability to formulate an answer to a question that repeats back my question to me, demonstrates that you can answer my question, and then and summarize it then finally. Uh, as well as, you know, I look at, like, one of my favorite things is to say, can you provide a specific example of a time and the amount of times I don't get something specific back, well, you know, I work a lot in projects, and, and it's like, okay, can you give me a specific example? And I'll repeat it four times, and you'll be surprised how many times I do not get to a specific example. Versus, I had somebody come in recently for a, a traffic coordinator position on our um, sort of marketing operations team, and she had... I didn't select a resume, so I can't tell you how she got there, but I joined her uh, interview for about 10 minutes, and she had zero experience. She'd been through a sales program of some sort for about six or eight weeks. She just graduated last May from, I think, A&M, but I forget. Um, and she, I asked her one question. I don't remember what it was, but she spat back the answer in the exact format that you're taught. It specifically answered the question I asked. I said, do you have a question for me? And she wasn't supposed to be interviewing with me. Uh, and she said, uh, well, actually, I was listening to a podcast you were on recently, and you recommended a book. I've read that book, and now I have a question. And I, I left that room, and I, I made it a mission. She was, like, she really was just too young for the role that she was, inexperienced, sorry, for the role that she was applying for. But I made it a mission to get her a job at our company. Uh, my boss had her admin assistant leave and she was looking for more of a, a project manager kind of assistant. And I gave her that role. Um, and then we actually had another role open up on our team that ended up being a little bit more elevated than what she had initially applied for. And she's in that role she started three weeks ago and she's fantastic. But I knew she would be as soon as we found the right role for her because I'm like somebody who understands this. And so people who do things like that in interviews that demonstrate to me that they've researched who I am, oftentimes I'll ask, what are you about Christus Health? And they will literally know nothing. <laughs> and, you know, what have you, what have you if, especially on their second interview, I'm like, what have you taken the time to learn since? They will know nothing. So if you've taken the time to do things like that, it makes a huge difference for me when we get into that interview. The, and, uh, I mean, I've had people where I've said, can you tell me quickly 30 seconds about yourself so I understand? who then take the entire hour. <laughs> that is literally not a joke. That has actually happened to me multiple times. And I, and I go, well, thank you, right? Um, so, you know, if, you, if you're actually paying attention and if you're able to effectively answer interview questions and if you prepare for the interview, demonstrate you prepare, took notes, like all of those things, it's amazing how far ahead that will put you over every other candidate that's applying and interviewing. Well, thank you so much. In the interest of time, we'll probably wrap this up. Yeah. But I just want to remind you that you are the best thing that you have. 
And so you need to take that and use it. You know, whether it is an introduction, whether it is um, developing your uh, LinkedIn profile, whether it is in the interviewing process, you are the best that you have. And so do your homework and be the best that you can be in every interaction, and especially those interactions that are important where you need to persuade other people. So thank you all very much. You were great, great audience. <laughs>